Time to enter another moral maze. Here's Michael Burke. Good evening. This week the government has gone to extraordinary lengths to look after the financial affairs of a not particularly large British company. Huntington Life Sciences will now have its accounts directly with the Bank of England because the high street banks are all too scared to deal with it. For there are two views of HLS. Either A, the governments, that its laboratories are a vital part of the country's claim to be a centre of scientific excellence, or B, the protest lobby, that it's not much more than an animal concentration camp where our fellow creatures are subjected to unnecessary and unjustifiable cruelty. HLS and those who deal with it are besieged by a loose coalition of animal lovers ranging from the soft-hearted to the concerned to the crazed. It's the fiercest battleground for those who say higher animals share much of our genetic makeup, feel both pleasure and pain, and so should be accorded rights with equivalent legal and moral status to humans. The other side says animals cannot be conscious human beings, cannot have duties, and therefore cannot possibly have rights. So, uh, who is right? about animal rights. Our Moral Maze live tonight with our panel, Dr David Starkey, teller of tall but true Tudor tales and a constitutional historian from Fitzwilliam College, Cambridge. Professor Ian Hargreaves, the former editor, now academic at Cardiff University, writer and broadcaster. Claire Fox from the Institute of Ideas and Janet Soskis, the Catholic theologian from Jesus College, Cambridge. Um, Claire Fox, um, right? Rights? Animal rights? I think actually this debate tells us a lot more about how we view humanity than animals. Um, and I think it degrades our view of humanity. The unique characteristics of humans, rationality and consciousness and the ability to act on the world are today questioned. I think it tells us a lot about what we think today and suggests that we're no better than animals. One of the most powerful metaphors of modern history in relation to the Holocaust was that people were treated as bad as animals when they were transported in cattle trucks. Now we call it a Holocaust of rats. My goodness, we've got a low view of humanity. Ian Hargreaves. Well, I, I think I feel about philosophers of animal rights the way I feel about, say, Buddhist priests. I'm not sure I exactly understand or agree with them, but I'm glad they're there, adding to the spiritual and moral pressure, because we do need pushing to think harder about the way we treat animals. Our industrial-scale cruelty towards them is too easily forgotten. It reminds me of prisons before we had prison visitors, and I do think more legal protection is part of the answer. David Starkey. To say that we, as Ian has just done, that we ought to be nicer to animals and that the only way we can do it is by giving them rights is a complete and total non sequitur. I do not believe in universal human rights because there's no way that you can give the word right a sensible single meaning. To try to extend the idea to animals actually devalues it at all meaning. And one of the questions that I want to ask the advocates of, um, uh, of animal rights is to give me a sensible, simple definition of the word that applies equally and inclusively to human beings. Janet Suskis. Animals should be afforded legal protection, but is the best way to do so by giving them rights? I'm very worried about the curiously quantified arguments that animal rights advocates use. Sometimes it's that we share 98% DNA with apes, but more often it's that higher animals share our mental and social capacities. But seriously disabled babies don't have these skills. Animal liberationists like Peter Singer don't shrink from the conclusion that we should not fear to kill newborn disabled babies while cherishing intelligent pigs. Who makes the criteria for legal personhood and who will preserve these criteria when we next want to change them? Panel, thanks very much indeed. Our first, um, our first witness tonight is uh, Andrew Tyler, who's director of Animal Aid, mm. which, is, uh, uh, which is one of the more radical, if not most radical, and certainly isn't that, of protest groups. Uh, yeah. Andrew, you say animals should have rights, uh, yeah. in a nutshell, because we're going to unpack this, obviously, mm. we're going to unpack a nutshell. Um, which animals, what rights? Well, all animals that are sentient. Uh, the rights they should have uh, should be the rights to be free from exploitation, torture, and to be killed for, for no purpose. You know? uh, okay. uh, Self-defence, I think, is a valid reason. I think unwitting killing of animals, because that happens, that's, that's a valid reason. And I think uh, a mercy killing. But the large-scale industrialised choreographed slaughter of hundreds of millions of animals is, is immoral and unwarranted. Claire Fox. Um, you say all sentient beings, so yeah. do you think that humans are simply sentient beings? Is that the only distinction you would make? 
No, that isn't the distinction. In fact, that is the kind of DNA version of human beings. This is, this is the version of human beings, the reductionist version of human beings that uh, molecular biologists have. I have a much more holistic uh, view of human beings. They're complex, as are animals. And the key is feeling, sentience, intelligence, the capacity to feel fear, the capacity to aspire to something more than to live a life in a crate. Yes, but there is no capacity amongst animals to Well, that's your view. More. No, it's not my view. They've never actually organised a resistance movement, have they? They haven't, they haven't composed sonatas, but that's not the criteria. The criteria is they form social groups, they form uh, family groups, they protect their young, they have uh, extraordinary qualities. So you, think that, in, you, and you think that them. instinct and consciousness, you're making the point that they're the same thing, protecting no, your young, that's instinct. instinct. No, instinct is, a, is a, a degraded version of what I'm talking about. A degra uh, it's, not a, it's not the term I would use. How would you, you know, no, whenever but it's, anything, a, but it's an accurate term. No, whenever, whenever animals do something extraordinary, we call it instinct. When people do things that are extraordinary, we call it genius. But they have never done anything extraordinary. They have never planned or done anything consciously. That is the animals. criteria you would apply to extraordinary. A dog can run, can run extraordinary distances, ha has fantastic capacity to smell and sense, has fantastic. So, you're, uh, can I just clarify then? So, you're, you're basically saying that what matters about beings is protecting the young instinct your behavior and you're actually saying it's extraordinary behavior that's extraordinary so you actually have got a rather limited view of what you think is extraordinary do surely you, do you valid the family unit and the capacity and and, and the impulse to protect the young uh, no the relationships I thought, within it i would have thought that was very important. argument no no the relationships within it not the family not as a unit well, let's let's start from let's start from first principles I would have thought the, the capacity and the aspiration and, and, and the way family groups are executed, if you like, within animals, all, all species of animals, the way the, the young are protected, defended. These right, are, so this these is what are, you reduce humanity to. I'm just trying to clarify no, that that's I, what you think are the essential no, points. I mean, cause I'm just, saying that these qualities animals have, plus many others, we should recognise and value them. OK. Um, can I just uh, ask you, even amongst the most trained apes, which, by the way, have been trained by humans often, um, it takes them which four years those? to crack a nut, for example, and they've never managed to go beyond um, the abilities of a two-year-old. I think the difficulty you have do, is... Do you not think... No, but don't yeah. you think there's a danger by equating that behaviour, which has actually been modified by human intervention, that you're simply reducing human achievement to that of children, no, the, the very most the, basic the, the, level the of... The problem you action. have, the, the, you're looking at animals and measuring their worth and their intelligence uh, in a humanocentric way. Animals are not interested in cracking nuts and writing sonatas. That's not the way we should judge them. Janet Soskis, your witness. I have a, a real question that I've long wanted to ask someone at one of those animal rights stalls. And, mm. and uh, you'll see that I'm asking as a Catholic theologian, but one often reads that um, people who advocate animal rights believe life is of intrinsic value. And yet I've never seen any mm. literature that shows that there's a consistent anti-abortion case also implied in this. What, what is your view? If you're consistent about valuing all life in this way, should you also be anti-abortion? Well, people have different views on that. I, the, the whole... The whole process of abortion, especially when the emphasis on the, are on the rights of the women, full stop. Although the rights of the women are, are also important. But abortion, especially late stage abortion, I find very upsetting and discomforting. But if you're saying, do, do animal rights have a doctrine on it? I think our doctrine is that if you're going to do something invasive and and cruel to any individual, there should be consent where possible. If there isn't consent, it shouldn't take place. But intrinsic value to all life, wouldn't that, wouldn't the human embryo be the test case of that? I mean, I mean people have different views on animal, uh, what, animal status as well, but you're quite quick to dispatch the... I haven't dispatched it. What I've said is I respect life. I have more respect for life that is sentient, capable of feeling, I think the first principle is to recognise what we do in our culture, which is to exploit, consume, and in many cases torture, literally hundreds of millions of animals every year in factory farms, slaughterhouses, laboratories and so on. Um, uh, could, could I just be clear, at the beginning of this I said, you, you know, you're one of the more radical, yeah. but not most radical groups. How far would you go? You wouldn't actually sling a bomb at uh, Director of we're committed, Life we're, Sciences? No, and Huntington Life Sciences, nine to fives, 
their job is to abuse animals and kill them. And yeah, although no, I, I was interested in yeah, how, well, our I, policy, how committed our, you are Our to... policy is we're, we oppose violence, we oppose harassment, intimidation. We want no part of it. But would, you, me, would you condemn those who do it? Can, I think once we get into the condemn thing, we, we get into a personal sphere. So what I would say is our position well, yes. is... Yeah. <laughs> and the, the motives of people who, for instance, throw a brick through a fur window... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to start judging those people on an individual basis. I think our position is clear. We oppose violence. Uh, we, we reject it. OK. Uh, David Starkey. I said at the beginning that I was going to ask uh, yourself and uh, Professor Stephen Wise for a definition of rights, as I understand it, to make sure I'm correct. Yeah. You listed animal rights as follows. Freedom, freedom from torture, and freedom from killing and exploitation. Yeah. Would you limit human rights to those three things? No, not at all. So you would recognise, then, a very radical difference between humans and animals? I'm saying that at the moment it is not recognised in this culture. There is a pathological denial at work that is not recognised the appalling, large-scale uh, treatment, uh, cruel treatment of animals that takes place in terms of their production and slaughter. Can I, can I just stop you that there? You're not, forgive me, you're not answering my question. I'm asking you to say, you said that you gave me one list of rights that belong yes. to animals, and then you said, obviously, those rights belong to humans, but then you implied, I think, that there were lots and lots mm. of other rights that humans had as well. Now, therefore, you're acknowledging that humans and animals are separate and distinct. No, what I'm saying is, what I'm, what I'm saying quite directly is that ours is a practical movement. First of all, can I just finish? Yes, you may. First of all, we have to recognise the reality. And then we have to persuade people, because we're not in a position to dictate, that animals deserve, in the first instance, basic rights. The basic rights not to be abused, tortured and killed can, in an animal. Can I just fashion. stop you there? You said it's a practical movement. Yes. And we have to persuade people. Now, when you mean practical, you mean it's not founded in reason. You're simply using, you've admitted, rights as a rhetoric, because you're not applying rights consistently to humans and animals, are you? There are other rights that, that animals require. Uh, a dog requires to be walked, a dog requires water, a dog requires proper treatment when that dog is sick, and many other animals too. So what I'm coming back to is, first of all, the recognition of the large-scale choreographed violence and abuse that takes place, and then to establish the argument uh, for basic rights being afforded animals. We can then move on and get more elaborate, more sophisticated. Uh, can I then just ask you a final question? Um, if we look at the other groups that have been incorporated into this universe of rights, slaves, women, the lower orders, yeah. They've then become equal participants. Yes. Where do you see animals as fitting in with their separate rights? Well, animals have, have, have their own, if you like, uh, universe almost. They certainly have their own nations. Uh, what we need to do is to back off uh, and let them live their lives, not judge and persecute. And that would be a good start. In other words, what you want is animal apartheid. Animals live their own lives, they have their own requirements, their own habitats, their own family groups. What I'm saying is it would be a major advance if we left them to it and didn't intrude in a violent way. I don't way. think uh, Mr. Verbo uh, would uh, have disagreed. Ian Hargreaves? I thought that you were saying something uh, slightly different from that uh, when you began. Uh, I thought that you were saying that human beings shouldn't use animals as their instruments. I is that your position? Yes. Is that different? Well, I think it is a bit different because it raises the question of whether um, a human being should use a horse to ride on against the horse's will. Well, the reality is that the, the, there are hundreds of thousands... In fact, it's been said there are more horses in Britain now than in the days of the horse-drawn carriage because they're left in fields. Uh, but, but do you agree... Every animal has its own world. Every species has its own requirement. But answer the question about the horse. I mean, is it your view that a horse used as an instrument of human transport is an abuse of the horse's right? Yes, I would say so. But I would, I would also say that if a, if a horse lived on a farm and was treated with respect and worked on that... And I'm not talking about a farm producing animals, but was treated with respect and worked on that farm, 
uh, wasn't abused, then that's fair dues. But for someone to enjoy riding it, like uh, I think the next witness might confess to occasionally well, doing... Well, it's, it's a difficult issue because there are a lot of rescued horses who need exercise and, and frankly, you know, there aren't herds of horses that can go about their, their thing in a natural fashion anymore. Uh, Andrew Dynas, thank you, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, uh, our next witness uh, certainly is a, one of the more famous uh, horse riders around, Professor uh, Roger Scruton. Um, the fox hunting philosopher, author of Animal <laughs> Rights and Wrongs. Um, <laughs> Roger Scruton, you... figure, yes. <laughs> out of your view, yes. Thank you. Your view, as I understand it, is that, um, uh, that we may well have a duty of care to, to uh, at any rate, some animals, uh, but they do not and cannot possibly have rights um, as such. Why not? What, what, what is to you the crucial difference between human beings and animals that deprive them of the right to rights? The crucial difference is, I think, that they cannot participate in the dialogue which is uh, implied by the, that concept, the concept of rights. Uh, we accord rights to each other, claim rights against each other. Uh, in the legal sense, we sue each other for our rights. Uh, and we recognise that um, these claims that we make against each other also impose upon us duties to respect them. And, and I take the view that this, what I call, calculus of rights and duties is a very important instrument whereby human beings regulate their social conduct and come to agree with each other about how to live together in society. There is a, a consensus-forming strategy, if you like, which, um, which we, we can engage in because of the features of human beings that Claire has already referred to, in particular self-consciousness, free will, um, the ability to see one's own situation in terms of past and future, and so on. Can I stop you then? Uh, uh, Ian Harvey, so, your witness. Uh, uh, animals are different because they can't be moral maze panellists. I think it's one of the one of the Some consequences. Of the mad after yes. all. Mm. One of the consequences of this is, of course, that animals would not be panelists on the moral maze, but, nor, but, nor would they be witnesses. But but, 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 but could there be um, a moral maze deep in the rainforest uh, of uh, of animals talking to each other, as it were, engaged within their own moral community? Yes. Could there be different of animal course, moral communities? Uh, well, there are. One assumes because there are tribes of human beings living there. You know, I mean, uh, and we are animals, but there are, there are different kinds of animals. And it could be, I, w I wouldn't close my mind absolutely to this, it could be that there are social animals which uh, have passed that barrier between the merely conscious and the truly self-conscious and, and, and do engage in this dialogue. Exactly. So, so this is not an absolute position that, that you're advancing, which is important because mm. when we come to uh, what is really the practical end of this moral argument, namely how should we treat animals and should we um, accord better legal protections to mm. them, uh, how, how do you judge, for example, if you, if you look down the list of the two and a half million um, animal experiments or animals that were experimented mm. on uh, in, a, in a year, uh, how do you yourself morally reason about whether it's justified to do it for cosmetics or for reasons of medical research and so Fine. on? Fine. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree that there's a problem about this. I, uh, I, would, I think that invoking the concept of right just uh, confuses the problem, uh, b partly because it, uh, as has been made clear, I think, by the previous speaker, previous witness, it abolishes the crucial distinctions between people and animals that enable us to understand both of them. It doesn't follow that we have no duties to animals. We, we do. Uh, but the, uh, one of them, of course, is to ensure that insofar as we are taking responsibility for their lives, we treat them properly. But, but uh, aren't you saying, put slightly differently, that whilst animals uh, are not, in your view, nor in mine, actually, entitled to the same basic universal right that we would entitle to another human being, I would anyway, David Stark, he says he wouldn't, uh, that animals are nonetheless, um, it is proper to think of animals as having some yeah, rights. For example, sure. the right not to be uh, made to suffer horribly when being killed for food. I think that we certainly judge people in these terms. But, uh, you know, people should, we believe, take 
due care when killing animals for food. They shouldn't cause unnecessary suffering. This is something which has been a legal principle in our law in Britain uh, for a, a, a century. And I think uh, I would accept it. I don't think that this is talking in any way about the rights of the animals. It's saying something about um, our duty to behave in a humane way. Well, it is saying something about the rights of the animal to the extent that uh, some people will not agree to abide within this framework of moral expectation. Yes, and I agree, but, uh, but we don't uh, uh, punish them or condemn them in the same way as we would uh, if they were gratuitously um, inflicting suffering on human beings, and certainly not uh, the way we would punish them if they were uh, killing human beings. Well, you know, we, we make these radical distinctions, and these distinctions have to we, do with we, our recognition we, of we, a difference we, we, of status. We, we, we do, but so do we make different moral distinctions about the circumstances in which we kill other human beings. Mm. When we kill them in war and in different types uh, of war, there are different moral mm. uh, gradations. In, in morality, it's the distinctions that matter, not the similarities. Exactly. So what we're agreeing is that a hierarchy of moral principle here does in some sense extend through humans and into the animal kingdom. I that wouldn't disagree th that with that. Of course, we have moral duties which uh, involve the care of animals. Likewise, we have moral duties involving the care of trees. You know, uh, rainforests, for instance. Janice Oscars, think. your witness. Mm. Um, Roger, you've spoken um, about our duty to behave in a humane way, and I want to bring in uh, the point that you are a, an outspoken advocate of fox hunting, which some people would say is um, patently not behaving in a humane way towards foxes. Now, I think there's an admirable honesty about your book. You praise it as very British, very English, and you don't pretend that it isn't at all about class, um, which it seems to me that it is. But what I wanted to ask is how particular is this support just for fox hunting? What are the limits of our humane killing of animals? I mean, for instance, hunting in Western Canada when I grew up involved throwing crates of beer in the back of a Chevy and putting on a red jacket and shooting the hell out of some furry animals and getting absolutely plastered. Now, this was a cultural phenomenon, but perhaps it's one you would not want to engage in. Is that equally humane? Um, there are a lot of activities that my fellow human beings engage in which rep uh, uh, appall me. Um, football is one of them. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't follow that I'd want to ban it or, or that I think it's morally wrong. I, I think everything depends upon the, the nature uh, of the action and the way in which the, um, it is conducted, the kind of concern for the quarry in the case of hunting. My own view is that uh, I, I know how fox hunting proceeds in, in England. My own view is it is, uh, actually exhibits enormous concern for the quarry and uh, precisely because it's conducted under an ethos of fair play, it raises the animal from the status of a mere, mere vermin to a, a, an honourable contestant. But the, but the fear of the animal is very important, isn't it? It is. And, of and of course animals do feel fear and we, uh, and we inflict this fear on them every time we kill them, every I, time we take a cow to the sword. Don't get too bogged down in fox hunting, but do you, no, think, no. The, do, do you think the fox uh, uh, appreciates uh, its elevation to the role of on, honourable contestant? In a contestant? way, it doesn't appreciate it, but its status uh, in relation to us has changed. It means that we learn to live with it and not exterminate there it. There must be some consolation to it, I suppose. David Starkey. I would really rather like to pursue this because it's such an interesting argument. Killing culture is what we're talking about, isn't it? Fox hunting was part of a broader attitude mm. to killing an aristocratic attitude that valued killing in war, that valued imitation killing in jousting. Are you really a man out of your own world or out of the real world? You actually believe in the values of a chivalric world and a noble culture, don't you? Um, I certainly respect them, uh, and when I encounter them in literature, my sympathies are, are aroused. I, I happen to live in the modern world, however, and recognise... Uncomfortably, isn't it? Yes, like you. I don't know anybody who does live comfortably in the modern world, uh, but um, I, I, I have not seen very little sign of it, actually, Claire, over the years. But um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, somebody, For someone to set up an institute of ideas and claim they live com comfortably in the modern world is absurd. <laughs> You're supposed to be talking to me. Yes. Uh, much hard, much tougher nut to crack. No, no, does, I, that, does that then mean, <coughs> and just so that I want to be very clear on this, mm that you do ascribe a real value to fighting between human beings, to an honour code, said with duelling, to chivalry to women. I do. I, I, I think that honour is a virtue, 
Uh, I think that people should strive to uh, behave honourably. I think you believe that too. I think that people, not that people should fight, but they should be brave in their confrontations with others and that they should learn to accept risks and to, and to take risks and to court danger within the limits that, uh, that a rational being should. But Roger, should. this does not accord at all with a view of the world that's based on universal human rights and uh, political absolutely. correctness. Absolutely. I've never believed in universal Thank human you. rights. Well, great. OK. Professor Roger Scruton, thanks, thanks very much indeed. Right, our last witness is uh, uh, Professor Stephen Wise, who teaches animal rights law at the Harvard Law School, author of a book called Rattling the Cage, which was um, uh, rather emphatically described as the animal's magna carta. He's on the line from, um, from Boston now. Professor Wise, um, it is, I think, implicit in your view that there's little, well, perhaps nothing, in the way of a, of a very clear distinction between the capacities of, uh, well, some animals and human beings. Is that, is that the case? That is the case, and that, that would follow from uh, Charles Darwin's idea of evolution by natural selection. And you don't think that some of the arguments that have been advanced so far, which I hope you've had the opportunity of hearing, that there, is, there are really quite radical distinctions uh, in terms of self-consciousness, in terms of um, uh, creating their own moral universe and so on, uh, that these are not uh, very clear-cut distinctions between animals and even the high, uh, between the higher animals and human beings. Uh, there, there certainly are differences uh, they are probably differences of degree and not of kind but uh, the science is uh, not clear in many aspects of this okay Janet Soskis your witness uh, professor wise in uh, rattling the cage you sketch a picture of a long period of mental bondage in the West uh, indebted to Greek philosophy and Christian and Jewish thought in which Everyone thought there was a great chain of being, a hierarchy with worms at the bottom and, and us, of course, at the top. And you say that this is a universe that no longer exists and that we now understand that evolution teaches us that animals are all more equal. Yet you don't really believe this, do you? Because in your book, you're intent to privilege and give rights to certain intelligent social animals. Uh, they are, um, I, I put it to you, that is a speciesist argument, isn't it? Because you, you're, you're judging what's uh, estimable in an animal by uh, thinking of qualities you like in human beings. Surely cockroaches are just as much evolved as, as great apes. Well, that is actually a slight misunderstanding of my, my argument in Rattling the Cage. What I see is uh, the history that, that you set out ended up in this great legal wall that indeed we have created to separate all humans from all non-human animals. What I, what I tried to do in Rattling the Cage was to show that that wall is not in any rational or unbiased position and that it needs to be knocked down. The Being a lawyer, uh, what I want to do is to present the strongest argument, which, which is the, the argument for fundamental legal rights for chimpanzees and bonobos, for knocking that wall down. But, you don't but I emphatically state that, that I indeed am not um, confining my arguments just to chimpanzees and bonobos. Uh, well, that's clear, but you don't dispute the fact that the, the criteria by which you're judging these animals should be accorded certain rights is their similarity to us. Oh, no. There, there are uh, two uh, distinct arguments I make. One is the equality argument, which is that non-human animals who are similar to us in fundamentally important ways are entitled to similar rights because that's the nature of equality. But the second argument I make is, is an argument from l liberty, which says that uh, a non-human animal who has certain uh, characteristics that, is, uh, that, that, that are of uh, tremendous value to that non-human animal himself or herself, that alone uh, should entitle them to basic legal rights whether they are similar to us or not. Right. On this question of legal personhood and legal rights, you seem rather in the book to suggest that unless uh, a being has legal rights, they don't have any um, protection under the law at all. Well, that's not true in this country. Animals I have protection. Well, there's a difference in, in, in having a protection and having a right. Uh, if you have a protection, then your your interests are are then placed in the hands of someone else, say the 
police or public prosecutor, and those people can either decide to try to protect you or, or, or not, and all sorts of policy decisions will enter into their decision to decide whether to protect you. If you have a legal right, you usually have a right of enforcing it, uh, or someone can enforce it but on your behalf. when last did a chimpanzee retain you as a client? Yesterday. <laughs> but then you're a liar. <laughs> try, and answer, try, and answer, David, yes, try and answer the question seriously. <laughs> try and answer okay, the question uh, seriously. Well, well, a a uh, chimpanzee, uh, no non-human animal has ever directly retained me because uh, he or she, like my three-year-old children, have no conception of a legal system or lawyers. Janet, you were briefly... Uh, yes, um, but surely the idea of, of uh, animal rights is a catchy phrase, but legal nonsense. Wouldn't this just be a terrific fundraising bonanza for lawyers if we had all kinds of litigation brought on behalf of animals? Because it would have to be brought on behalf of them, as David said. They couldn't enter into negotiations on their own behalf. Wouldn't it be a legal nightmare? Uh, no. In, in fact, the, the actual... Uh, processes are, are relatively clear in any common law country and prob in fact in probably most countries uh, we we already know how to protect the interests of incompetence either uh, p either human beings who are too young or too old or too insane to uh, to have to be able to understand that they either have interest or can represent their own interests so we we know how to appoint guardians ad litem for example uh, Claire, Fo Claire Fox your witness um, I think that's the point, isn't it? Is, is that the handing out of, light, of rights, Professor Wise, is a rather cavalier use of them, and I do appreciate that they've been handed out rather cavalierly to a whole range of people who otherwise weren't considered to have them, and handing them to animals really is the final straw. Do you not think that this is rather dangerous in terms of what rights mean, that were long fought for, by the way, by human beings to protect themselves? Well, the sorts of rights that I argue in Rattling the Cage and in a second book I'm writing that non-human animals, or at least some of them, should get are the very basic sort of rights. Uh, the most important being probably the right to bodily integrity, the right not to have, uh, to be the subject of an unconsented to touching or an assault and batteries. It, it, it protects their lives. It, it protects the most basic interests. And I, I don't think it's an abuse of the legal system to to give a right to any creature uh, who has these kinds of basic interests to Well, basically, protect. you're giving the rights. That's the whole point. They're not being fought for, and they're not able to be acted out on, and so, therefore, we actually make a mockery of what rights are. By the way, if we can do that so easily, we, they can, we can take them away as well. That's the most important thing. Once we establish that cultural norm, do you not think that you're in danger of setting a precedent for rights to be cavalierly handed out, acted upon, and then taken away? I don't think so. I, I think it's a very honorable uh, thing with historical precedent to have um, one set of people fight for the rights of another set of people who can't speak for themselves. Ian Hargreaves, you wouldn't uh, Professor Wise, um, can you, uh, do, do you... You know the story of Sophie's Choice, where a woman uh, is obliged to choose between two of her children, one of whom will go to a concentration camp, one of whom won't. Yes. Um, yes. Can you imagine any situation in which you, as a parent, would choose um, the health and well-being of um, an animal you live with and love over a child that is your child? Uh, no, I, I cannot. If, uh, in fact, if you ask me, uh, if I had to choose uh, between a chimpanzee and my daughter, I would automatically choose my daughter. Um, I would automatically choose my daughter over you, too, as well. Exactly. And I would probably kill the chimpanzee, I'd kill you, and I'd probably have everyone in, in the universe killed in order to save my daughter. So, what, so, so, what that shows, though, is, is how much fathers love their daughters. It doesn't show anything about justice. Uh, no, it, but it, it, it may show something about justice as well. But if... Uh, the situation were that um, you were choosing between um, a healthy chimpanzee and a brain damaged infant, would you like Peter Singer, who I think has influenced your work, uh, choose the chimpanzee or at least argue that it is morally acceptable to choose the chimpanzee? If, if you took the, the extreme, uh, say the very um, most conscious, healthiest, smartest chimpanzee and a human being, a, a, 
of any age who is in, say, a, an, an irrevocable coma, of course I would choose so, the chimpanzee. So if that human being in the coma is my child, you deny any kind of um, moral right on my part to preserve the life of my child? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not actually taking your uh, rights or feelings into consideration. I'm just trying to choose between, the, uh, between a chimpanzee and, and a human. It's, it's the, the difficulty I'm having is, is because of the way you posed the question. David Starkey. As I understand it, you're saying that there's a natural progression in the according of rights from, say, slaves to women, the lower orders, and then to animals. At least some non-human animals, yes. But... If we look at your, when you got cross with me, when I talked about does a chimpanzee retain you, you then answered yes, the question, <laughs> you, answered, you answered the question by saying we have a perfectly established procedure uh, as with an infant or as with somebody who's mentally retarded. Isn't the difference that the species of chimpanzee will never be able to sue? That there is a clerk that you're consume, uh, that you're confusing, which as a lawyer you shouldn't. At least lawyers of the calibre in Cambridge, England, you're confusing an individual <laughs> case with a group case. Well, rights are individual things. Uh, they r rights, uh, at least certainly in the United States, and I would suspect I, I would suspect in the UK as well. Uh, group rights are frowned upon. Individual rights are what are favoured. But sorry, and you're talking about a group. You, you 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 use the rhetoric of extending rights to slaves, to women, to the lower orders. Why do you suddenly bottle out when it gets difficult for your argument? Oh, be, because I'm not speaking about groups. I'm speaking about individuals and, and individuals only and when when we speak about but this humans, class of individuals will never be able to enforce their own rights doesn't that suggest that you're misusing the term the term right is a right that only applies within a political community a political community of responsive uh, mutual uh, human uh, beings that understand a common language for group activity chimpanzees but we know will never that that's belong not to true that. We not know that, true. but we know that's not true because my my three year old twins do do not. She's not. Mentally she hasn't got political rights. She hasn't got political rights, does she? That's or right. That's the point. Are we making the same point? She does not have political rights. She does not even understand anything about rights. Yet, if you try to to, uh, to violate her bodily integrity, uh, she does have rights. I think the and American so Constitution he. gives more rights than bodily integrity, but perhaps you haven't read it recently. Dr. David. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that, Professor Wise. I, I'll have you know, this is the 4th of July, and I celebrated it by reading the Constitution just this morning. <laughs> All right, Professor Wise, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, uh, panel, j let, can we just take the two points that came up ag again and again um, in this discussion? First, you know, whether uh, rights are inextricably linked to uh, responsibilities to duties do we think that's the case or or, or do, do we not think that's the main pl plank of the argument Ian Hargreaves I, I, don't, I don't think that it is I think that uh, I think that we heard uh, enough um, to be convincing uh, that there is um, a, a hierarchy of rights imaginable arguable defensible which extends through blurred lines between uh, the animal kingdom and the human animal kingdom I think that the the, the really really difficult argument that the animal rights people uh, are not addressing properly is whether more animal rights must mean less human rights that's the point that Claire began with and I think that that is the heart of the argument but David Starkey, you'd come back on the on the first part of that, would you? I mean, you need sentient, politically rational people to have yes. rights. The what, what Ian is doing is what, in fact, Andrew Taylor was honest enough to admit. He's using the term right simply as a rhetoric for saying we ought to be nicer to animals. That is an abuse of language. Andrew Taylor, whom I thought was extraordinarily impressive because he was so honest, said that it's a mm. practical movement. It's not a movement that uses precise language. It just uses blur. He actually uses... talked about a dog requiring a walk and yes, therefore yes. having a right a to right. walk. But, but did, you, did you draw a distinction between the requirements and the right? I did, on the whole. I mean, uh, I, 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 would, I would also... I was very curious about this business of, of accepting a uh, horse's right to be exercised. Um, I mean, can you... Uh, there are many of our politicians, I think, that we would like to subject this to, but uh, on the whole, we wouldn't regard it as serious. And I found, frankly, the sort of arguments that we heard from Harvard absolutely scandalous.
Why? Um, for the simple reason that there was a complete shift in this of language. The idea that you accord rights to an entire class of individuals that can never actually aspire to exercise them makes a nonsense of the term. But they actually, I mean, there is, it's really dangerous, this whole thing, because although Andrew admitted it was a rhetorical point, the reality is, is that now the use of the term rights is being so broadly used, and I think that real political rights that actually you have to exercise in order for them to mean anything are under threat. That's the reality. Once we start affording rights to people who can't exercise them, then we're in danger of trivialising well-won, hard-won, and I tell you, I want to protect them, <laughs> rights. There's so a that's a scary bit for but, me. But, it's but, more but, than but, a rhetorical but, but, point. But Professor Wise was right to say that his three-year-old child also is not able to personally defend and but maintain her own rights. Yes, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean to say she doesn't have rights. I don't think children have rights. I don't think children have rights. I think it's ridiculous. to act, That's what's happened with the children's rights movement, which is that actually what's happened is everyone's doling rights out that they cannot actually enact upon. No, the, the, Therefore, the, making us all into children, because in fact it infantilizes or empowering, no, or empowering the, the, on our behalf. Yeah, on our the, behalf. Empowering an awful lot the, of the, overpaid the, lawyers the, to prattle the, and the, the reality is that no Nobody's yeah, rights can be exercised solely by them as an individual. We all need networks of... of but uh, not at all is the key, Ian, which you, like, uh, uh, like, like whatever he's called, wise, but not by, uh, by name. Um, uh, it's confusing. A right that you cannot exercise yourself is a nonsense. Exactly. But there are practical difficulties in all this that we didn't actually get to. I mean, where do you draw lines on these things? Nobody's talking about the bodily integrity of rats and... Uh, and co oh, you raised the question of cockroaches. Well, it's self-defence. Janet, Janet self-defence. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, I, again, I think it is a, a very great danger of uh, what appears to be just a question of being nice to animals uh, uh, introduces us to a, a hugely contentious area. Why should we be nice to great apes and not dolphins? I don't see an obvious difference. And if dolphins, why not whales and many other creatures? And, and then we're getting to a, a position of real absurdity. But the main point I, I feel confirmed in uh, the point is the point that Claire made, that once you begin to transfer the rightless language over to assign it to a different group, then you're in a real danger of eroding that. And if we get in this position, we are no different from in the last century, uh, certain groups, uh, the Nazis, Pol Pots, who decreed that certain groups of people, Jews, homosexuals, and so on, were subhuman and so not entitled to rights. But Claire Fox. I just think it's, it's fascinating to me that in medieval times, the serfs that were run free slept with the pigs and were treated like animals. And we, you know, it was a kind of sign of the backward culture that that was. They were and warm. freedom managed to, in cultural terms at least, <laughs> distinguish between animals and humans. What we've now got to at the beginning of this new century is a whole cultural movement that suggests we're no better than animals. So it's not even just the rights question, it's culturally, but, we're putting ourselves but, in the same... And category. we don't have any but, many but, responsibilities but, either. But it is true that the form of the argument bears significant resemblance, say, to the argument about slavery. Those who did not want to give up Purely the, pra gi give up no the practice of resemblance. slavery, but they, didn't, they, they didn't want to do it, it really because, because the they argued it would, the blacks it would can diminish their, 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 their own well-being. And the blacks are just like animals, according to that rule. Oh. Oh dear, we have reversed into an entirely different uh, subject. No, uh, that's it's the it. same uh, I, No, I appreciate that, David. That's it for this week from our panel, David Starkey, Ian Hargreaves, Claire Fox and Janet Soskis, and from me. Until the same time next week, goodbye. The Moral Maze was presented by Michael Burke and produced by David Coombs.